Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's topic of conversation focuses on the children of Holocaust survivors. These are children raised by parents who, as young people, were forcefully evacuated, rounded up, moved into ghettos, crammed into cattle cars, and taken to concentration camps where they experienced the worst atrocities imaginable. Those who were not killed were separated from their families and forced into unspeakably harsh conditions of hunger, squalor, disease, excruciatingly hard labor, and constant beatings. Or perhaps they lived in hiding in terrible conditions of atrocious deprivation. Their lives were shattered forever, but somehow they survived and created new lives and new families here in North America. Our guest is the daughter of Holocaust survivors, and she wrote her PhD thesis on the experiences of children like herself, some of whom internalized their parents' suffering and have had to deal with everything from curiosity to anger to guilt to denial and even separation anxiety and PTSD. She's written a book entitled, For This I Survived, Children of Survivors Beyond the Trauma. I'm pleased to welcome Bruria Lindenberg Cooperman to our show. Bruria, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for asking me. Bruria, of course, our parents' stories influence who and what we become. And for children of Holocaust survivors, it's a complicated mix of feeling different from their friends, sometimes being embarrassed, but also very proud, knowing that their parents were incredibly strong and resilient heroes. What made you decide to write this book? Well, I think it's time. It, it t we got older and it, it takes a lot of time for things to, 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 you know, percolate in my brain. And I think sometimes that it, it, it was just too raw at the beginning. It, it just hits you too much. You also, when you're young and you're a teenager, especially when you're a teenager, you don't have the equipment to deal with this. Not only don't you have the equipment to deal with maybe traumatic parents, you... You don't you don't have the equipment to deal with other teenagers and how they you know the bullying how you're different making fun of your name all the various things that teenagers do to each other. By the time you're an adult, you go you know what I don't care this has to be said. The story is just bursting to get out, and that's what's happening. One famous comedian described living with Holocaust survivors as growing up in a sea of skeletons. Is that how you felt? I want to tell you that it's not a monolithic group, just like every group. Some of us just ignored it, and some of us were sucked into that pathology. I felt less because I'm, I think I'm going to bring the psychology here. I'm like my mother, right? And we're both space cadets, and we just kind of go off into space, and that's our way of dealing with it. And I was just talking to my husband yesterday. I was talking to somebody who talked about their a mother who had overdosed when she was younger. And I thought, geez, I knew my mother was a bit of a space cadet. And then I realized, you know what? She had a couple of nervous breakdowns and I didn't realize what they were at the time. So, you know, sometimes later on, but a sea of skeletons, she tried to protect me. My father tried to protect me, but that wasn't the case in, I have a friend who, who said there wasn't a day that didn't go by that her mother didn't tell her something on the phone. About Not, the Holocaust. About the Holocaust. Not one day. Can you imagine? Well, it seems that children of Holocaust survivors fall into one of two categories. Either they grew up knowing every detail about their parents' suffering, or they grew up knowing nothing at all. There seemed to be no in-between. Why is that, Bruria? If you talk to people who have gone through trauma, you'll talk to their children. In this case, this is universal. A lot of them don't talk about it. And sometimes they wait until much later to talk about it. I don't have the full psychological you know, expertise to deal with it, but... You just don't talk about it, it'll go away and it's fine. And sometimes it comes out later in different ways. It just kind of bursts open. But there are different ways of dealing with it. Well, don't you think it's interesting that some Holocaust survivors were able to speak much more openly to their grandchildren about the Holocaust than to their own children? 
That's exactly what I was going to tell you. They will tell you. I have one friend whose father would sit around the table and start talking to the grandchildren. You know, when there was a holiday, would start to tell them things. And, and the children go, where did this, where did this come from? And, but it was coming up. And I think it was a matter of time. They learned to live with it. They had been also processing it. Also, you know what? It also depended on your kind of experience too. What, were you a fighter? Do you remember that movie about the, um, what were they called? The Binsky, something with B about those boys in the, in the forest. Her father was in the forest as a resistance. He had absolutely no, you know, he had no trouble talking about it. It was a different kind of thing. Some were embarrassed, but yes, then the time goes by and they started talking about it to their, to their grandchildren. The other day I was talking to my grandchildren. It sounds really crazy, but this is what we do. You know, they're getting their vaccinations now and they're talking about protecting the children and bringing up all these kind of things to help them. And I'm saying to one of my, grands, my, one of my grandchildren, do, are you nervous? He says, no, I'm excited. I said, you don't need anything special. I said, you gotta be tough. That's the way I am. You've got to be tough. He said, yeah, I am, Bubby. <laughs> so that's, that's how you react. Do you think that movies like Schindler's List made it easier for survivors to talk openly about their Holocaust experiences? For some. My father went to Schindler's List because he was in that camp. And he was a tough guy. You know, he was in these... Later on, he was in the Israeli army. He was in the Chablan, which is the terrorist group. So he was a toughie and he would talk about it. My mother wouldn't let him do it, but he went to Schindler's List to find out if the guy, the, the evil guy was hanged. You know, that's how he did it. My mother, she didn't want to talk about it. You know, she hid it. So it was different, you know? You wrote that at first, it was assumed that children of Holocaust survivors were consumed by pathology and emotional trauma or paralysis. But now we know that many survivors passed down a great many skills to their children who turned out very successful and happy. Isn't that right? Absolutely. You know, I don't know whether it was, there were several things there. They gave us that's what I was talking about with the grandchildren. They gave us the skill to be resilient. If I would even start to cry, if there was even a little tear in my eye, my father would say, what, 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 why are you crying? Like, God forbid you should be comparing this to Auschwitz. You've got a headache. So that's also, we had that kind of, of resilience. How some people reacted to it, that's where the difference lay. Some people, are tough, they're kind of normal, as normal as, as you can be. And some are in the, are on the couch every single week, still to this day. Well, let's talk for a moment about the use of humor. You wrote that the secret source of humor is sorrow and that for Jews during the war, humor was used as a coping mechanism to provide momentary relief. And you said that Holocaust survivors and their children have a special brand of humor that they share amongst themselves because only they understand the context. That sense of humor really binds the community together, doesn't it? Absolutely. Now, there are some people who still cringe <laughs> when I, you, you know, the other day you had a wonderful interview with Dara Horn about people love dead Jews. Now, that is just so perfect. I use that title. I, I must say she came up with it, but I used 30 years ago, a friend of mine went to Hungary to help build the Holocaust Museum. And I said, how are you doing? He said, it's great. We've got all the people helping us and everything. I said, yes, Xavier, that's because people love dead Jews. And he, he didn't know how to deal with this. And to this day, I said it the other day to somebody, she just cracked up laughing. Somebody else, they went, oi, oi, what, what do you say? It's, look at all the comedians. Jews and comedy go together. It, it does, it's, you cannot separate it. 
Yitzhak Perlman said that when they were building the, the pyramids, there was a violinist there accompanying them because you know the crying. And somebody else said, look at that schmuck, look at what he's doing, what is he crazy? You know, he was doing the, the, you know, the commentary. It's 85% of the comedians in the 50s, right after the war in the 60s, were Jews. And they continued to be, you know, Jewish. The majority were Jews. We, you can't separate Jews from comedy. Well, I loved your comment in the book that a deep sigh by a Jewish person is considered Yiddish Morse code. Absolutely. We sometimes call, you know what? You have to get the book Zen Judaism. It, you know, it's, it's got some wonderful saying like, oi, if this is, it, it's, it's, it's the same thing, the sigh, sigh. Okay, a Danish and a coffee now. You know, it's, it's <laughs> one, now, one thing that I noticed about Holocaust survivors is that they had extremely high standards that were impossible to meet. For example, when I told my mother about a friend that I had, she gave me her definition of friend. She said, if the Nazis were in power today, would this person hide you? That's a friend. With parents like that, it's easy to feel like you're always disappointing them because no one ever measures up to their standards. Absolutely, absolutely. It, and you know what, sometimes it isn't until, and, and, and they're always afraid, and I've talked to people, they're always afraid of making you weak. So they always, they want you to be tough. They want you to survive this world. They want you to succeed. But you know what, sometimes secretly, they go to a friend and she says, you know, my daughter does this. They're very proud of them. But to you, they have to say, this is what you have. It was just a given. And, you know, they didn't even have to tell you to succeed. You knew that this was revenge. It's going to sound crazy, but this is revenge against Hitler. Oh, absolutely. This is how I was raised. You wrote yes. about the woman whose mother used to tell her, if you had been alive during the Holocaust, you would never have survived. Those kinds of comments can be very biting and emotionally damaging, don't you think? Absolutely, but I use it on my daughter. <laughs> you do? Yes. She, she's, yes. Mea culpa. When she wasn't aggressive enough getting something, I don't know if I actually said it, but she says to her friends, and I love it. She says, my stepmother says I would not survive in the Holocaust 10 minutes. And she says, to, she absolutely, she loves it. She says to me, Brew, you're right. I wouldn't survive. I'm not like you. I said, now, I always remind her of my mother because she knew my mother and my mother had a big influence on them. She said, we always say like this, what would Miriam do? You know, that strength, that resolve that she, you know, had to go through, do it. What, 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 what do you mean you, you can't do it? Of course you can do it. So Jessica does say, that's what my stepmother says. And she's absolutely right. Well, I've noticed that for Holocaust survivors and their children, developing trust for other people or for the government or banks or insurance companies is particularly difficult because of the betrayal that they experienced. Did you notice that as well? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I hope I'm not talking about myself too much, but the, you know what, when I got my, my PhD, our daughter, Jessica, was also getting her PhD. She called it me search. <laughs> So this book is really me search. And, you know, I invited a few friends. So what happens was, is my mother, I, I, people are always quoting me, don't fall in love, which means not love in the romantic sense, because she used love, but she meant do not get attached. Just don't get attached. Always have that kind of that always what's going on, what, and be prepared to be disappointed. Just be prepared. Also be prepared to fight back. But we all were there, you know, I still meet, we meet, I've got a group of women. We get together and speak Yiddish for an hour on Zoom. And sometimes we meet and 
and we're just hucking the Yiddish and everything like this. But we are all have the same attitude. And we came, we were all Holocaust survivors, we're survivor kids, greenie kids. And we all feel the same way. We always have a healthy mistrust of governments. And we're always willing to skirt and to go around and to see and get exactly what you need to get, because that's how you survived. Well, you write about the dynamic between the Holocaust survivors who immigrated here and the Jews who were from here. It wasn't always a mutually agreeable or supportive relationship. And there wasn't much empathy for Holocaust survivors, was there? No, not at all. And by the way, I must bring this in because somebody said that should be your second book, but I'm, I'm in Yiddish, I'm oiskespiel. I can't do another. I can't, do you know Yiddish, Harvey? I know oiskespiel. that term. Yeah, I'm oiskespiel. It was because it, uh, I was raised in, in Israel the first few years. It was the same in Israel. Now, Dara Horn would be on this page. When it was convenient for everybody to talk about the Holocaust, then they did. But at the very beginning, they were ashamed of us. Why? Here, we had funny accents. We dressed differently. They thought we wanted to take their money. We thought they... It's, we were the other, literally the other. And it was the same thing in Israel. And they said to us, I was like, can you imagine telling my parents and other parents, why didn't you just fight back? Like, what are you talking about? They just didn't get it. They didn't get it. And you know, and, and, and if somebody were crying at the cemetery at the very beginning, it, what are you crying? Get over it. Enough. Just get over it. They just did not get it. And you know what? People pay lip service onto it, but they still don't get it. How can you just imagine what these people went through? Well, you know, a, a lot of people whose parents were born in Canada didn't understand why our parents were hoarding food or covering every inch of furniture with plastic or not going to restaurants, or being extremely overprotective so we couldn't have sleepovers at a friend's house or go to summer camp. We lived a very different kind of life than the other kids did, and it showed. Absolutely. And you know, I'm trying to think of all these, you know, I was raised in uh, Hamilton. So that was really, because there were hardly any survivors there. Toronto had a, you know, a number thing, but people who were raised in smaller towns or lived in other areas here in, in, in Toronto, we were compl that's why sometimes you, you, you gather to your own kind. Remember from West Side Story, marry your own kind, you know, which is why a lot of people gravitated to their own kind because you did not have to talk about it. Do you know, in the, you're too young for this, maybe. Do you remember the basement bars that they built in the 50s and 60s in houses? Yes. Yeah. Well, when we came to Toronto, we would gather with other Holocaust survivors and parents would be, and this is very immigrant. All immigrants do this. The parents are gathered in the kitchen. The men are in the living room playing cards or talking and the kids are in the basement wrecking havoc, you know? So, and there's like a full liquor cabinet, but nobody touched that. Like, you just didn't do that. But you just talked, you talked and you never talked about your crazy parents because you just understood. And we also knew, we also knew that some were, and I, I'm going to use this word, we used it and I apologize, that some were crazier than others. Just some were just off the wall, but we understood and we had total sympathy for that, for that person. One part of your book that really resonated with me is about how World War II was taught in high school in the 60s and 70s. There was virtually no mention of the Holocaust. And because I was the only Jew in the school, I didn't have the guts to stand up and say, hey, teacher, there was something else going on in Europe at that time besides the famous military battles. There was the Holocaust. Now, given the very public nature of the Adolf Eichmann trial in the 60s, are you surprised 
that Jewish kids still felt too insecure to speak up about the Holocaust in school? Absolutely. No kid wants to have attention called to them, right? You want to be just like everybody else. It's very rare for a, a, a kid to stand up and say, hey, I'm Jewish and I'm proud and this is what I do. But it's a little bit easier, but kids still want to be accepted by other kids. They want to be, they want to be normal. You know, my, my husband was a pediatrician and the, the mother said to the kid, and, and they were immigrants also, the mother said to the kid, but I want to be your friend. And she said, I don't want you as a friend. I need a mother and I want to be normal with my, my, my friends. Leave me alone. And that's what we all want. And, and uh, we all want that. And even to this day, but I must say, I'm very proud of, of our grandchildren. You know, and they, they just, they're just out there. They're out there and they talk about their Jewishness. They're not embarrassed about being Jewish. So that's one good thing that, that's come out of all these experiences of talking about it. Another thing that really surprises me about Holocaust survivors, considering what they went through, is that so many of them continued to believe in God and they stayed connected to Judaism and they were very active in their synagogues. I would have thought that they would lose all faith in God because of what they went through, but most of them didn't. Don't you think that's amazing? Absolutely. Absolutely. My, my father didn't go to synagogue when he came here. I didn't know any, none of our friends went to synagogue maybe because we weren't really we weren't you know close to the uh more orthodox uh, people who did go back there were quite a few greener greeners you know um survivors call them greeners because i'm a greener a greener j just like in in english a greenhorn is somebody new to society so we we were called greeners it, so a, a greener in the Jewish community is somebody who's new to the, to the Jewish community. Quite a few survivors became Shomer Shabbat. It always boggled my mind that somebody could go back to God. You know, it's like, how can you even be, believe it? But a lot of them, as they got older, started to go back to synagogue because it was a social club and, you know, they, they met other Jews. And also the greeners hung, hung out with other greeners and they felt comfortable with each other. I mean, it wasn't because they became very, very religious, but synagogue became a way of, uh, of like a social club. I would imagine that was, that's what it was like in Europe too. Not everybody was, was religious. There were various levels of religion. And a lot of people went because it was a way of meeting uh, other Jews. You mentioned in the book that a high percentage of children of Holocaust survivors go into the caregiving professions, like social workers, psychologists, doctors, and nurses. Is that because in a very real way, these kids had to be caregivers for their parents? Most of us were caregivers growing up. We were caregivers. Remember, I'm going to sneak in a little thing. Don't you remember that woman in my book who had to, had to go to the doctor? She was five years old and had to translate. Her mother, her mother was pregnant. She had to translate for her mother what the doctor said. Five years old. She didn't even know these, you know, these terms. And we were, I signed all the notes. I was the translator. All of us did that. We were just talking about the other day. We just, you did things. Can if the stuff that we did or were expected to do, family and child services would be on the front door arresting your parents. We did that. In your research, what did you learn about the parenting skills of the children of Holocaust survivors? Do they end up being as overprotective as their parents were? You know, I, I don't think so. I, you know, I don't remember, recall any specific, maybe now since I got the, the, you know, I did my research, there is more because we're going into, now we're going into the third generation and I don't know that research, but there are studies now being done about grandchildren and how that is, be, how they're being affected by their grandparents. I think when I'm, when I'm thinking of my friends who, as parents, 
they were sort of little versions of their parents. <laughs> <laughs> Many versions, American versions. And they, they were just as protective and very, don't go there, don't go there, just, you know, don't. So that's what they're, is, is that Jewish or is that green? I think it's normal. I think it's normal too. T today, most children of Holocaust survivors are senior citizens. The population is aging. Do you worry that once our generation is gone, our parents' stories will disappear and be forgotten? Absolutely. That's, that is another reason I did the, the book. I, I wrote the book. I, I just want it out there. I, I don't know how else to get it out there. I don't know if that book is just going to languish or maybe I'm hoping that other people will pass it along. I know people now have passed it along to other people, but I don't know. Now we're remembering the, the stories of, of the soldiers in World War I and World War II. And I'm hoping the same thing will come about because of the Holocaust survive the Holocaust. But then it might be just another footnote. This is what I'm afraid of. Many people say the Holocaust could never happen again, or at least that it could never happen here. Do you agree? Absolutely not. I'm getting I'm getting fitted for a pair of glasses, right? And this young man, a nice, wonderful, an NJB, a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> and he is Gale, which is yellow, he's, he's born here. His parents are born here. Grandparents are born here. And we start talking and we start talking about the anti-Semitic uh, incidents. And he said, that will never happen here. I said, excuse me, what did you, what? He says, no, that's impossible. It would never happen here. I said, young man, I wanna tell you something. My uncle, they were so sophisticated in Europe. My uncle ordered a Fiat in 1938. That's how sophisticated they were. A friend's uncle used to go skiing in Switzerland. We weren't peasants. We lived in, in houses with art and with music and with culture. And guess what? Poor Jew, rich Jew, cultured Jew, Haredi Jew, everything. We all landed up in Auschwitz. So. When you are, you and I are in line, I'll say hello to you, but keep your head up. Wow. Well, Buria, I want to thank you for this very insightful and eye-opening conversation. And I want to thank you for your book. It's a welcome addition to the Holocaust literature that I've read. And it taught me so much about people that I know and also about myself. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you. And I, I appreciate it. I recommend the book highly. Our guest has been author Bruria Lindenberg Cooperman. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel and be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.